welcome to a joint hearing of House and Senate Education Committees. And I am Senator Phil Baruth for the uh, Senate Education Committee, and I'm joined by Kate Webb, House Education Committee. Uh, and thank you to our guests from Education Commission of the States who have traveled to um, talk to us about proficiency-based education. Um, would you like to uh, join us, gentlemen? I'm, I'm not sure if you'd like to come up together or separately. I think Joel's going to go ahead and defer to me. I'll just OK. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so if you could just introduce yourself and give us your affiliation. Great. Matt Jordan, Director of Strategic Initiatives and Education Commission of the States. Go ahead and start. Please. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I believe you have hard copy notes of the slides that I'll go through, and we can provide any additional follow-up information if you find any of this useful. So, um, let me tell you a little bit about Education Commission of the State before we get started, or as we get started here. So again, I mentioned Matt Jordan. I've uh, been with the organization about four years as a policy director. We are based in Denver, Colorado. We were created for states by states. So what that means is we were created to be an unbiased source of information for state leaders like yourself and the executive branch. So it's just really the whole spectrum of players. So that's really a few things I hope you know about us. We are unbiased and nonpartisan, which is to say I'm not here to give you a policy outcome. I'm here to let you learn from what other states are doing and what established research and practices show. I also want you to know that we cover the full spectrum of education issues, from early learning all the way through uh, post-secondary workforce. So that gives us a nice view across the full spectrum of education. And this slide I added in, so this is a little bit of diversion from, from your notes there. The other thing I want to make sure you know about us, though, is that we cover the full spectrum and serve all key players at the state level. So we work across all 50 states, and our commissioner structure, our governance structure, is set up where our chair is a governor and rotates every two years between Republican and Democrat, and then our um, vice chair is always a legislator of the opposite party, and then our secretary is a uh, 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 usually a higher ed official, and then our treasurer is usually a chief state school officer. So our mix of, of representatives, our constituents, if you will, really is the full mix of who you all work with every day across the, the education spectrum at the state level, which is governors, legislators, chief state school officers, higher ed officials, and other important policy leaders. So again, we were created to be your resource, and so we really appreciate the time to be here. So um, now I'll jump into the, the presentation. So I understand we'll do, I'm going to run through this fairly quickly, cover quite a bit of information. You all have given us a number of questions to address, and so I'll, I have a team of, of uh, colleagues in Denver and a few here with me in the back here. So we're going to go through your responses and then leave time for Q&A. So these five questions. What is proficiency-based learning? How does it work in other states? How is it incorporated in transcripts? How is it used in college admissions? And what are the effects of implementation? So we'll go through those questions today. Let me uh, start with a little spoiler alert, though. Um, again, we're not here to give you uh, advice on what you should do. We're just here to help you think through what are the practices that other states are doing or what we've seen through research. So our underlying belief, though, is that effective policies come from thoughtful design and uh, uh, careful implementation. So thoughtful design, careful Im implementation, which means we really applaud you, Joint House and Senate, getting together to study issues like this. So we get called to give testimony like this around the country, and we really want to applaud you to take the time to get together in your busy schedules to take, to take a, a look at this important topic. So what is proficiency-based learning? It's also been called competency-based learning or education, mastery learning, or uh, competency-based education. In proficiency-based learning systems, students demonstrate uh, desired learning outcomes through the learning process. 
right? So that means it allows them to move at their own pace. And so learning is the constant. Time is the variable. Now, you all know in traditional systems, there's a set calendar. And students go through the curriculum based on that calendar. Whereas in proficiency-based learning, time can change based on the progress of each individual student or subgroups of students. Proficiency-based learning, or PBL, can uh, produce different types of measurements. So you may be aware, one of the key issues is, do you use the traditional A through F grades, or do you go through a different numbering system? Perhaps it's like one through four, or one through five. So that's one of the features that you see sometimes in PBL systems, is using a different grading system. So those are the basics. Now let's talk about what does it look like? How does PBL work in other states? So in 2012, this was a snapshot. You can see a purple are the advanced states, green developing, orange emerging. Only a handful, back in 2012, only a handful of advanced states at that time. Now this is an analysis by the Aurora Institute from a snapshot that they update they gave last year. So let's fast forward to 2019. So you see, proficiency-based learning is growing, is a growing trend, growing interest across the states. And the number of advanced states, the purple states, had grown. Now, back in 2012, Vermont was shown as an emerging state. Now you're listed in the advanced category. Now there are, um, as of last year, uh, 17 advanced states, and these are states that have a comprehensive policy or alignment um, that, you know, that there's an established state active state role. In the developing states, in District of Columbia, which are in green, the, the state has more of an open policy and flexibility. And in the emerging states, there's limited, more limited. So this is a gradation of sort of the, 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 the range of state policies, what this is trying to show. So definitely a growing trend across the country. Except Wyoming. Except There's Wyoming. Nothing going on. That's there. right. <laughs> As of last year. So we're going to give you three case studies, three examples to look at now. First with Illinois. So Illinois is an example of pilots, local districts piloting proficiency-based learning. So they passed in 2016, the Illinois legislature, competency-based um, high school graduation requirements. And at that time, in 2016, 10 pilot sites, pilot districts started. And it's grown to 45 now, so from 10 to 45. And what the districts were doing in Illinois, or are doing in Illinois, their graduation requirements are replacing certain parts of their current system. So in one of two ways, either they're um, replacing some um, core curriculum elements like math, language arts, or both, or which years they intend. So meaning uh, two years of math or years of ELA. So the point here is that they're implementing changes in graduation requirements across different districts. So dist districts get to pick which competency-based elements they're going to implement in place of more traditional curriculum. Now there are some required components though, and they have a mapping between competencies and academic standards, a plan for determining mastery, and data collection. The, so you're going to hear that theme throughout. There's going to be different choices that you have for districts, but data collection, professional development, which are things that they built in here, are important themes. So Illinois, we have an example of different districts trying out graduation requirements. In our home state of Colorado, a little bit different approach. Here, the State Department of Education is allowing districts to explore different strategies. So less uh, um, 
requirements in terms of what they can implement and more support around different ideas. So here it's a more of an open-ended approach where the department is working with a number of districts of, of all sizes to help them to a study group facilitated by an outside agency or outside uh, organization called Achieve, which many of you may have heard of. They're um, exploring different strategies, but the last prescription. I can tell you on a personal note, as a parent of a seventh grader in uh, Denver Public Schools, where our school is implementing many of these standards, I have a chance to see this as a parent and as a member of the site council. So it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, comparison here from a parent and professional level. In New Hampshire, which you all may be aware of this one, this is an example of a uh, pilot around assessments. So the PACE, the Performance Assessment for Competency Education, is the first of its kind pilot uh, allowed by the US Department of Education that is um, designed to measure proficiency more reliably and collect local assessments to state assessments, to, to state assessments. so more connecting local and state around proficiency-based standards. And the idea here is that um, state that local um, districts will take the time to develop standards based on the different proficiency items that they create. So it'll give more real-time, formative types of feedback, but still keep it connected to the state level. They, uh, for, this would be for grade, grades three through eight. Now, students in the high school level would still take the SAT. So the pilot is really at the elementary and middle school grades. Now, this kind of assessment brings up some interesting policy questions for you to think about that we'll explore. Um, the questions around comparability, validity, and transparency. So uh, the pilot is, again, still early, but a great example to look at what um, variability will allow across the district. So we'll now move on to the third question around how is PBL incorporated into transparency? So the states that have advanced proficiency, proficiency based learning tend to leave design of transcripts up to local decision makers. But there are certain components or standards that experts would say local decision makers should take into account. The first is clarity is important. So clear expectations of what the transcript means. In addition, cross-cutting or non-academic competencies, such as habits of work or communication or problem solving of you know, skills, can be included. But you need to have good descriptions of what those are so they're understood. And you can also have descriptions of capstone projects, uh, internships, and other learning. But again, in a way that makes sense for um, folks who would be reviewing them, whether they're parents or post-secondary. So item number one, clarity is critical. Another component is um, transcripts. Uh, uh, well, uh, under, another point under clarity is critical. Transcripts can balance traditional and non-traditional measures. So there are a couple of examples. The Great Schools Partnership, which is, you know, nearby, based nearby, and we'll work here. They have um, transcript models, templates you can look at, that help crosswalk the GPA to the less traditional measures, to these competency-based measures. measures. So Great Schools Partnership has an example of transcripts you can look at. Another group is called Knowledge Works, based out of Cincinnati. They do work across the country. And, and their um, students master, they, here they show students mastery uh, through various subjects, and then they break down the mastery into subcomponents. So instead of just a letter grade, you're looking at where students are across different dimensions and subdimensions. So Great Schools Partnership, Knowledge Works are resources you can look at to really see what um, transcripts and how transcripts can handle these traditional and non-traditional measures. So another point is more, uh, less is more, right? Simple is better. Too much information can be overwhelming. And so making sure that um, teachers, parents, and post-secondary uh, admissions folks know what's in a transcript is going to be an important component. So you will have it, so they'll want to make sure that they're clearly delineated. 
Another component, and this is one that you all have given attention to, is this flexibility around grids. That you, while a PBL system in its purest form gets away from A to F grades, you have allowed in, in your uh, practice here, which is we've seen in other states, more flexibility. So districts can choose. Supervising unions can choose whether they're going to implement uh, the full grading system or adapt across the traditional system. And in this case, again, the idea of assessments comes in. So we use the Vermont, or the, excuse me, the New Hampshire example for you all to look at. As, we, as you think about grading systems, you want to take a look at what the local assessments are and how they connect to the state. So the, so the, the standards are the core, and how students are achieving mastery to those standards is the core of it, not necessarily what their grade is. So the next question had to do with college admissions. There have been a number of surveys of college admissions officers around the country, and they tend to see, uh, consistently indicate that PBL systems do not put students at a disadvantage. So that's good news. In fact, many say that they embrace the uh, goals of a PBL to present a fuller picture of knowledge. Again, this idea of looking at state students' mastery across different um, competency areas. However, it's important to remember that admissions officers have thousands, many times thousands, of transcripts to look at, like we talked about earlier. And so this idea of transparency is important and having clear definitions. So we're going to explore that and unpack that here a little bit more. Uh, study of, or this survey of, of admissions officials talking about GPA, that one of the issues to really think about where they can, where they, a problem can emerge, and so something you want to avoid, is when um, you have inconsistent standards or that um, you have a lack of information, so that, that uh, transcripts um, don't convert well across different systems. So that is, um, looking at an example here from the um, New England Board of Higher Education in the New England um, Secondary School Consortium, where, let me just read a few of these quotes here. Students with proficiency based transcripts will not be disadvantaged in the highly selected admissions processes. Features of the proficiency based transcript model shared with the group could provide important information for institutions seeking not just high performing ac uh, academics, but engaged lifelong learners. So many colleges already receive transcripts like this, these non-traditional transcripts. So this challenge isn't entirely new. Selective admissions leaders at this meeting stressed how their institutions receive applications from across the country and around the world, which represent a diverse range of high, high school environments and a variety of grading, grading scales, terminology, and transcript design. So they're used to seeing variety in transcripts. But again, clarity is key. And it's critical that the uh, admissions leaders interpret the proficiency-based transcripts so that having the ability to engage in them is something we'll explore here next. So implementation effects. So we've talked about how um, transcripts are critical. We've talked about how you can engage with uh, higher ed leaders to work on those transcripts. So let's talk about what implementation looks like a little bit more fully over the next several slides. So effective assessments of proficiency. Experts will tell you Assessments need to be valid, generalizable, and comparable. And this is one of the most important parts for PBL, that you have solid assessments. In other words, assessments need to measure the important proficiencies aligned with state <coughs> standards, and then measure those standards, you know, link those standards to local, to what is being taught in the classroom. The implication is, if some students are held to a higher standard than others because tests are inconsistent or unreliable, unreliable then transcripts can't be trusted. So that's why you really want to make sure that the core focus on assessments is, is critical. 
So what can you do about it? How do you um, go about um, these timely assessments? It's where you have the regular connection between, and I believe, again, we uh, had a chance to visit with folks from the Agency of Education. It's the ongoing communication, the ongoing implementation strategy between the state and locals so they can make sure that their assessments are staying aligned and are um, meeting the standards. And so uh, state summative assessments can be measured on a reliable uh, proficiency-based standard. Second, there we go. get my notes a little mixed up. Timely completion. So if students are working at their own pace, it's important to make sure that they don't get too far apart or that they, you keep them moving at their own pace. So if some students take more time than others to become proficient, they can fall behind. So that's the, the timeliness aspect to think about. The states need to monitor the impact of PBL and think about accountability in terms of the amount of time state students come through. And it's also important to, for, uh, in these systems that, um, that the motivation factor for students is kept there, that they see the reason why they should keep moving beyond the letter grade, that their mastery of the subject is what the motivation is for them. And then the next time, so students, now we're talking about teachers in terms of professional development. So what teachers need in an environment like this are strong materials, instruction materials, and an understanding of the evaluation. So working with uh, teachers that they, the lesson plans align to the standards and then they understand what is in the assessment. So ongoing collaboration with educators is a, is a hallmark of what we've seen in the thoughtful um, design and careful implementation. And then, as I mentioned earlier, engaging with post-secondary partners. If they understand what is in the transcripts, if they have the ability to help shape those, and this oftentimes happens at a local level. Again, I mentioned the Illinois example earlier. What they're oftentimes doing is local districts working with community colleges or with universities in the area. There's how they can work and collaborate to make sure the transcripts are understood by post-secondary um, leaders of secondary admissions officials. Another element is CTE, current technical education. There's a lot of common ground between proficiency-based learning and CTE, and so they can match up really well when the standards align. Again, your Act 77 created personalized flexible pathways, and so that's very much in the mode of what career technical education would allow so students to be moved into those career tech tracks. So there's an opportunity to match your PBL system with your CTE system. That's very much of a nice acronym laden sentence there. But it's, it's an opportunity that these types of systems can work well together. And this point about engaging stakeholders, so parents and uh, students, two of the most important stakeholders, it's important, as you all may have already seen, that parents understand why there's a move to these systems. Educators, there's, while not universal, there is a growing um, consensus in the education community that these systems are superior. There are advantages to them. But if parents don't understand that, it can create problems, as you all know well. So continuing to engage stakeholders, including parents, uh, it'll be an important part of this. Because the reality is students get used to the traditional system, right? They know A through F. They understand how to operate in that traditional system. So helping, um, hopefully through teachers guiding them, but and through other policy uh, communication, helping them understand the advantage to them and their parents will be important. Because you all may have studied what happened in May. So Maine, back in that 2012 slide, was an advanced state, right? And they um, established certain standards that were to be implemented by a certain date. And like um, um, many states, they were moving on their way. And as you all know, in 2018, that was rolled back. 
and an analysis, there's been several analysis of why that happened. And I want to summarize a few of them as sort of summary here. Now again, this is analysis by um, Chalkby Competency Works. So it's not our analysis, but it's one that we think was helpful for you to think about in summary as we get into a conversation. So there was a report that there was too much confusion. So this point about not enough clarity is an important thing to think through. Second, stakeholders, students and parents, were very much invested in things like class rank or valed valedictorian status, right? So they didn't understand why this other system would be worth giving those up. Third, teachers felt overwhelmed. And the analysis says that the pace went a little too fast. They weren't brought along in a way with the professional development. So again, remember the slide about creating resources for educators? So having an opportunity to, to equip teachers. Students themselves, this idea that they um, weren't bought in to the system, that they, again, thought um, it was, for example, homework. If it wasn't graded, why is homework important? So there, so there are changes that in these systems that encourage learners to grow at their own pace, so that's a good thing. But if the students don't understand why that's happening, it can be a problem. And the, the last thing um, is, this is again the, the, the analysis, not our words, that the state moved too fast, requiring schools to do, much too, do too much too quickly. So my spoiler alert earlier about effective policies. Again, thoughtful design and careful implementation. That's why you're taking the time to review these policies is a good thing, because you can give good feedback and stay abreast of what's happening. So clearly, proficiency-based learning is a growing policy area across the country. Almost every state, except for Wyoming, is dealing with it in some way. Right? The question is, at what point? And again, it's been my understanding, my reading, that um, the, um, the, the Agency of Education is taking steps to work with local uh, districts to, to let them make changes um, as they need to, to, to face their, to meet their local conditions, their local needs. The question is then, how do you help continue momentum over some of these barriers to move forward for what many believe is a worthwhile change, but you overcome thoughtfully some of the risk, resistance and address some of the concerns. So covered a lot of ground quickly. Maybe we can clear up any questions and add any value to questions. Uh, quick question about the nationwide outlook. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounded from your description as though most places are allowing pilot communities or individual districts to take the lead rather than uh, having a, a single top-down Solution. That's right. I'm wondering, in terms of um, transcript notation, mm -hmm. does any state mandate, uh, let's say, a hybrid system? Um, so, in other words, we're, we're <coughs> going to put in proficiency-based learning, but we're going to have a provision in law that says you have to have, as you go forward, a traditional grade grid as well as proficiency-based charts, graphs, whatever you use? Well, um, the Illinois example, the pilots that they have, so they, um, again, this is in their graduation, high school graduation requirements. They do, um, so they give districts flexibility, but it's a choice of menu options. Okay. And, um, and we, can, we'll, we can send you additional information in this as follow-up, but the menu options include uh, things like mapping between competencies and standards, uh, a plan to determine mastery, which can include out-of-school experiences. Mm -hmm. um, again, this idea of how they're going to collect data and what is their approach to grading. So the Illinois example does have certain requirements in the mm -hmm. statute, but it gives uh, districts flexibility. In, okay. in, in what and how they go about it, and what they choose, how they have choose to apply. I would be interested if you could okay. turn that on. We'll do. Yep. Uh, okay. Sure. Um, 
Can you let me know how many states um, in the current academic year, or even in the next um, academic year, um, require proficiency-based model for all of their high school students? Because it seems like from your discussion here, where some districts play here, some districts play here, we required it for all students in the state. I just want to see how many other states are doing something similar to us. Yeah. Uh, again, the um, the slide that we had related to um, where things stand now, we'll go back and see if we can find out how many of the states. Um, I think what the, well, let me say, I think what the advanced, what another way of looking at the advanced states is basically in the same, they're the same state category as Vermont. But when, you just said Maine rolled back and you saw have Maine listed as an advanced state. Yeah, I think what, my understanding of what they did in Maine is they rolled back the timeline. So, but not this current school year, they're not requiring that all students in the state be under this model. Yeah, what I'm saying is that what you're seeing here within these purple states, which Maine still stays there, they're still looking at a comprehensive statewide approach. That's why it's purple. The way they go about them vary, and it right. gives more flex. So it's more flexibility in terms of what districts do at, at, at what pace. So, but the question I have is, how many states this year currently? I mean, I get that they're yeah. moving that direction. Yeah, we've done it. Yeah. How many other states are where we are that it's done? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. According to this analysis, there are um, 16 other states, the purple states, okay. are in the same category. But, well, it, but it's still new enough that it's, you have to go back and look at each state in terms of where they are exactly. It's not like every, it's, it's not a uniform measurement. Right. There's different strategies and different path or different paces. So when the best thing I can say is you're in a category, the advanced category of certain other states, the, the story of what each state is doing varies. But it's safer to say though, because of those 16 states, not all of them have all their students under this model. That's correct. That's right. So it's less than 16 states. Yeah, I don't know if there's any state that has every student underneath their model, uh, underneath that. But again, the flexibility you all have too, though, is um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if you're that much further along or further behind is what I'm trying to say. I think, to my understanding, there are other states that are further ahead in other way, in some ways, but not every state is doing the same thing. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Peter? Yeah. Uh, could you, we hear different things about the, the impact on college uh, admissions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of our colleges united in yes, we can deal with these, or is it a mixed bag? You know, some colleges have got are small colleges and have a large admissions department. Other colleges are right. large and have a small admissions department. Yeah, and, and again, I mentioned the uh, this uh, survey of um, university uh, admissions officers, and they're here in New England, you know, you, your own. Um, Board of, of Higher Education, the, the Consortium of Higher Education has been looking at that. And again, what I read from you was that basically the consensus is most um, higher ed uh, embrace the idea. So from a conceptual standpoint, there isn't a problem with proficiency-based learning standards or systems. Like most things in life, the question is how it's implemented. And so if you have clear transcripts, and if admissions officials understand the transcripts, that's what you need to look at. But that's why I also mentioned that admissions officials have, they have a lot of variation in transcripts already. So it's not like this is differentiating from only one kind of transcript. The, I think the point here, whether it's a PBL system or not, you're, you want your transcripts to be as clear as possible. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I, mean, I think what I'm, the research we should have found is this isn't something in of itself is a problem for post-secondary, but there are certain elements you want to keep in mind, and engaging, continuing to engage that important stakeholder group is wise. Uh, yeah, Ruth. Um, so I have two questions. Um, first, on this math, mm -hmm. um, similar to or leading off from what Senator Parent asked, mm -hmm. have, is there any data on uh, how effective it has been across these states? And we have, what, 16 states who are purple states, um, at least seven years um, 
where between your 2012 and 2019 map, has there been any national research on is this improving learning for students? Is this better than what was there before in terms yeah. of? The, the um, research isn't conclusive because it's still too new. And that's why Senator Parent would ask part of what I was trying to explain. This is, um, so 2012 to 2019, what you can see is from a policy movement standpoint, there's clearly more interest in these systems. Now, your question is asking what impacts it have on the learning. Right. And it's still too early to answer that question from what we've been able to find. Are, are there, is anybody collecting data right now? Because now is the time to collect it. I mean, or 2012 was really to see, you know, what, what are we yeah. starting with and where are we going? Is anybody working on that um, to see if this is actually having an impact on student learning? The short answer is yes. Now, what, there are a number of organizations that study this closely. Um, but again, I think the, the question is at what scale. And so, um, again, the best answer I can give you is it's not conclusive yet, and yes, they are looking okay. into it. Because I think it's telling, a little telling that some of those emerging states, uh, Massachusetts strikes me, actually. That's a state that is always at the top of the national standards for student learning and, and uh, you know, high test scores, really, really excellent record for educating students and they're not doing it or they're just now thinking about it and um, that that raises questions for me as to why they're you know late to this game maybe they don't think it's worth it because they already have yeah. such a good system but that just struck me yeah. um and then my other question is um there was a slide that you had on equity mm -hmm. and I didn't quite understand what you what your point was there in terms of do, it, I wrote down connected and clear or it can worsen equity. Um, yeah. So I wonder if you could speak. Yeah. To that I, I, more. Um, what I was trying to say is, let me answer both these together. So these systems, one of the reasons why they are becoming widely um, studied and implemented is the idea that um, the standardized approach. <coughs> Um, well, there's a couple of problems with it. One, it doesn't meet enough students where they are individually. So this is an attempt to create more personalized systems based on confidence. Embedded in that is the idea that it hopefully will help equity, help those concerns around traditionally um, underserved students. Let me use the example, my own example, of my own students' my child school as an example. So that school happens to be an inverted bell curve where it has high learners and, uh, well, it has students who are ahead of uh, uh, grade and below grade and hardly any in the middle. The reason why they went to a personalized approach, concept-based approach, is so you can help move those groups along based on where each student is in, that, in their own learning continuum. So that's the theory behind it, mm -hmm. the, the promise of it, and that's why I think you're seeing a number of states trying to figure out how to make this type of system work, is it creates opportunities to help a broader range of students. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, but, yeah. I, I'm, if, but if it's done badly, it could yes. make that's right. inequity. That's right, that's right, okay. that's exactly, that's, what, that, exactly. That's, that's the other side of it. Again, not here to be an advocate for these right. systems. Yeah. But if um, the implementation happens in a way where, um, again, the, the theory is that students move along at their pace and that all students are moving along, high performers or, or above grade and, and, and below grade, right? But if just the high performers are the ones moving on or the band gets wider, that makes the problem worse. Right. Yeah. Okay, I have actually a third question, if I may. Um, right. Uh, and that is about cost, um, and it seems to me that this has a potential, and we're already, you know, as you noted, in mm -hmm. advance, so maybe the, you know, barn doors, whatever, let's say, of course, the cows in the barn door is out, but um, uh, you all know what I mean. Um, but uh, is, is this more expensive because we're trying to create personalized learning paths for each student that are based on proficiency standards, and so you might have to do something different for, you know, our schools are little, so, you know, 100 or 200 students. Um, that seems to me like that has the 
potential being a lot more expensive? You know, honestly, I haven't seen the research in that. So I, I can't tell you whether there's conclusive research and we can look in to see if there's any research on cost. But um, I think the point is that you want to make sure there's an investment in resources for educators. But I think that's true in any system. So I don't know if this system is requiring any more or less resources for educators. The point is you want to make sure that you have them. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. But you know, how much do those resources cost? Yeah, I, that's what, again, I didn't, we didn't research yeah. that, and I don't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Senator Reed. Thank you. Um, you said that learning is the constant and time is the variable. Um, is there some limit to the time, though? Does that go across grade, you know, across grade levels, or is there some, uh, is there some expectation that at the end of every school year, um, a child, no matter how slowly they've gone through, that they they have to reach a certain level in order to get moved on to the next grade? Or yeah, I think you know, again, theoretically, I think it could be flexible, but I do think it tends to the implementation does tend to fall within the traditional academic years. So there is an idea that you're trying to help students move through the great bands. Uh, but so yeah, I, I, it's my understanding, yes, there is some, some thought about where they should be in terms of their grades, but it's, there's more flexibility within those uh, grade levels. Um, okay, and in, is there any evidence about, um, say, in Vermont, you know, in certain areas, we have a lot of uh, English language learners um, and sometimes there's difficulty in knowing how where to place them when they for you know when they first come to this country. Um, we have you know we have refugee resettlement in a lot of areas. Um, is there any evidence from any of the other states about how uh, proficiency-based learning has integrated with um, English language learners in particular, and whether that's been helpful to them or not? We'll have to get back to you on that one. I didn't. I don't have that off the top of my head of how English language learners are impacted by this type of system, um, positively or negatively. Um, again, I think theoretically, if you have <coughs> systems in place, um, that it allows for more variation. Um, but again, I think that would depend on what resources are set up and, and how they're and how widely they're implemented. Mm -hmm. So we.
the, the, but implementing these practices takes time. So to your point about seven years, I think one of the things that it's good, maybe that, another way to think about this, maybe more incremental change is a good thing. Because I think one of the, one of the messages we hear across the board is uh, initiative fatigue, right? Mm -hmm. Too many things thrown at us, right? So that maybe is an argument for allowing um, things to move forward, initiatives to move forward at a pace that they need to. So it may take a while for a state system to get implemented. And having engagement with stakeholders and you may go too fast, and so you have to back up. Or you may not be going fast enough, and you have to hurry up. But um, an, an area we're maybe offering in this is to consider is not whether you should implement it or not, but if you're going to implement it, implement it at the pace that you need to, to do it right. And um, there tends, I think there's a, tends to be more consensus of let, let maybe let the initiatives that are happening move forward. Um, because again, this idea, so the, the, the worry is maybe initiative fatigue. Don't jump in and make a move in a way that would change direction too, too quickly, maybe a lot, but that's not to say you shouldn't get involved, but get involved in a way that maybe is more incremental is a suggestion to consider. Does that make sense? Yeah. And sometimes these things do take time, and, and sometimes seven years seems like a long, long time. I don't know if that's <coughs> too slow or too fast. Yeah. Yes. Just, you know, in a child's right. life, it's the children that are, you know, if it's working yeah. or if it's not working, the other ones that are going to right. be the recipients. Of right. Exactly. But I guess the other thing about it is education uh, changes are probably an ongoing process that are never finished. So hopefully, it's getting better. But there's probably always some amount of change in the system happening. Yep. Thank you. Uh, how do we involve or get our teachers ramped up to do these yeah. learning projects? Yeah. Has that been addressed, or have they been surveyed, perhaps, in terms of their? Yeah, I'm not familiar with what surveys have happened here locally. But again, that's why we pointed out maybe in the Colorado example where um, what they've done is the Dep State Department set up a basically a, a, a work group, a pilot study group of various districts with the idea that they're engaging their stakeholders at the local level and then having basically a shared study, a shared um, experience going through together, acknowledging that this is a process and it needs to be thoughtful and, and moves through. Uh, I, we'd have to do more research. And again, I don't know what the answer is in terms of where things stand now. But from a concept, that's one of the things we're suggesting states take a look at is how they continue to engage stakeholders throughout the implementation process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative James? I think my question was similar. but. Um, just anecdotally, it seems as though the districts that are taking their time in Vermont with a really thoughtful rollout that involves a lot of teacher support and training are doing well, and districts that just dropped it on people are, are not. So is there a, a best practice toolkit or a state program you would point to or that really has put the focus on teacher support, teacher training, stakeholder buy-in? It sounds like Colorado. Well, uh, Colorado is an, is an example in terms of like the state agency engaging districts in an implementation process. The resources that I mentioned, the Great Schools Partnership right. and Knowledge Works are two of several organizations. There's more we can point to. But, um, I know, for example, Knowledge Works, they have a, a state toolkit that talks about how to engage policy or excuse me, engage stakeholders and how to think about these policies in a comprehensive uh, way. Um, and again, my understanding of the Great Schools Partnership, they have, being here locally, they have resources and tools to help districts um, think through different implementation strategies. So there could be others, but those would be ones we point to. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing, we hear anecdotally. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of information anecdotally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we hear that Vermont is way out in front and, and 
school, colleges don't know how to, how to deal with it. So in reality, you're saying we're sort of in the first third, but it's a, it's a national trend. That's right. And, and again, uh, the, uh, there are organizations that study this more closely than we do. But when I actually spoke to one of those organizations in preparing for this presentation, and it was their assessment that Vermont, um, back around 2013, 2014, was more in the lead. But other states have maybe caught up or surpassed from a state policy standpoint. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad. But I think um, as you look at this map here, it's clearly a, a growing trend that states are looking into, a, a growing area of interest among states. And the challenge that we hear less on proficiency-based learning, but on proficiency-based grading is, right. is what we hear most of the confusion about. Transcripts and grading, yeah. right? Yes. I think are the points that come up. And again, educator preparedness. And that's why I think of all the issues you deal with, there's maybe more of a smaller subset of some of these things. And that's why I was talking about the clarity around transcripts, the engagement with post-secondary stakeholders, and um, equipping educators. Those are some of the key, key components that, um, that we pointed to. And you said that you have um, a research study of uh, college. Yeah, uh, we can make it available to you. Yeah, In no, fact, no, the, you. The, um, the slides that I am reading from have a number of resources in them already um, that have links to these, so we can resend it. And so there was a uh, uh, 2018 um, study of uh, uh, two different studies, one of them a national one of, of college admissions officers. And then there was a reference to regional here within New England of some of the conversations that have happened among the uh, New England Higher Education Group and this uh, secondary school consortium. Is there anything more you'd like to share with us, or are, are we at the end of your presentation? Understood. Just one. Yeah, yeah, we've covered everything. I okay. Yeah. Jim, I just had a question, uh, kind of on the on the coattails of what was already asked, but I was uh, interested in uh, parent involvement, participation, and understanding of all this, which I received a lot of emails negatively, <coughs> also with their with their children. So it's from teachers to parents to the students themselves, uh, there's a lack of uh, understanding and that I'm hearing on my end. I was wondering what I could go to or help those folks. Um, um, we, I would recommend, well, you know, I, I want to answer that two ways. One, the idea that the schools would be the that, um, providing information that the schools would already have. So um, giving, so hopefully it's whatever information you have, your local schools would have too, because if the parents are getting information that the schools don't have, that could create a problem. So hopefully it's in um, coordination with what your own superintendent or your own administrators would have. And that's the first point. But again, this is where there are national organizations that have different resources that are available for parents and for educators. Um, and that, so the, I think the question is, is it, a, is it a lack of information or is there some other concern below that? And um, oftentimes I think what's required is an ongoing conversation. And it's through that ongoing conversation is where you can address these. So um, again, we can make the information available and other organizations can too. But uh, pausing again, is all this thinking about as parents. The question is, are the parents, um, is it a lack of information or is it a, a, a concern that they have about the system itself? Thank you. Yep. So uh, we do have John Carroll with us from the State Board of Education. Um, John, anything you'd like to ask? Well, I think um, it's something we've discussed a bit. It, it's the question of equity. It, it, uh, it goes to Senator Hardy's question about measuring performance. I think, I think a lot of us feel that while some sectors of our student population may be inconvenienced, I think especially those who are trying to have transcripts to competitive colleges felt inconvenienced, certainly. But I think many of us are hopeful that PBL uh, really reaches to those students who 
are, are not so comfortable in school and not so well served. And so I guess the question for you, sir, is what is the, just referring to, so fundamental rationale for PBL is that it is a quality of opportunity for students. Okay. That's, I think, important to everybody in this room. What's the data that's showing that we're achieving that? Here in Vermont? Anywhere. Anywhere. Um, I, I think that's one of the key issues. I, I think what you're asking is if you look at the NAEP scores, if you look at scores, I think there's, it's, I don't know if that's an answerable question because of all the variables that go in to outcomes. Um, so I, again, kind of going back to the original question, I don't know if there's enough information to know that to answer that question. Uh, Sorry, just don't have that. Just don't have an answer for you at this point. Yeah, it seems like it ought to be. I mean, first of all, if it can't be answered, then <laughs> that's a serious problem. I mean, anything worth doing is being able to assess. Um, but it, it seems like there might, and this is for us to be thinking about. But there might be ways beyond name scores and that sort of thing. It, it might be simply possible to survey teachers. Uh, educators, maybe even students, to find out is there is is the world working differently for the student who is perhaps marginalized for any reason at all? Uh, is that student's world of opportunity enhanced by our four years of experience of rolling this out? Mm -hmm. um, that's as much a question to the educational organizations in the state as it is to you, sir. It just it, if this was the reason why we're doing it, we sure as heck we ought to find out if we're succeeding on it. Mm -hmm. We're moving the needle. No, fair enough. And without uh, any national data, it's a little alarming to see the colors shifting so quickly uh, with the whole country moving in that direction. Ordinarily, you'd have the, the early adopters would be providing the data, and then that would be what's driving the second wave, but um, doesn't seem to be the case. Other questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate the trip and uh, the deeper dig into it. I would be personally interested in um, those resources you mentioned around, I believe it's Illinois, and yep. what they do require. Yep. And then there were a couple of other data asks that I, I think you made. Question about cost, question about ELL. Yeah. yeah. And what is the, what is, go back and double check, and what is the uh, research on learning now? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.